but they're difficult to overcome. Um, so Zoroaster, they might say he almost got it right, but I can't quite give it now. The problem with Zoroaster, another problem with Zoroastrianism, they could not overcome the onslaught of Christianity that came later, and then later on when Islam came in, they could not overcome Islam either. Um, Zoroastrianism has made some news lately in that there are pockets of Zoroastrianism still living in Persia, or what is today Iran, and they are strongly persecuted by the Muslims, and they're also living in Iran. So uh, what few followers, most of the followers of Zoroaster we find today, moved to India, where they set up a few colonies on the western shoreline of India, and their followers are known to be generally very wealthy. Um, but it's just a small pockets of Zoroaster's religion still lives, but they were driven away from the original homeland of Persia. All right. Um, okay. With this, we come to the end of chapter one, and for the first time since Monday of last week, I feel like I'm some, somewhat caught up. Now, there are a few points, though, that I want to make about these chapters before we go on and begin next class talking about ancient India. Um, these realms had nothing that we could call a constitution. In other words, in the United States, we are not governed by our president. We're actually governed by a constitution who's, and our pres each president and each court, member of the Supreme Court and each representative and senator all swears an oath to protect our constitution. <clears throat> our constitution is really our governing body. The ancient world had none of this. Now, when we come to the Greeks, the idea of a constitution comes from the Greeks. The Greek cities, some of them did set up a constitution that was to be the guiding principle by which their rulers were to follow. But there was no constitution for most of these peoples. It was just each king would be set up or he'd set himself up. And within the first 50 days of his rule, he was expected to write down the laws that he wanted his people to follow. So he was given 50 days and he would make laws. And uh, this was to be the law. And then the next king would come up and he would decide, mm, now the previous king had this law. Do I want to keep this law or throw it away? And the new, the new king then would keep some of the old king's laws and throw out some of the others. There was no constitution. Everything depended on the ability of the ruler. In other words, if the ruler could command your respect, you followed him. If he couldn't command your respect, you rejected him. Now, let me tell you, when I was in the army, one of the things they emphasized to us, when you salute an officer, you're not saluting the man. You're saluting his rank. Whether it be bars, maple leaves, or stars, you're saluting the emblem, the rank, not the person who's wearing. The person who's wearing them might be a louse, but you salute him anyway because of his position. He holds the position. In ancient time, well, I only salute him if he's worthy to be saluted. Well, no, in the modern world, you salute the man who's who has the rank because, well, because we believe you should. Uh, but everything depended on the ability, to, we might call it charisma, how well could this man lead, how effectively could he lead? And if he could lead, follow him, if he couldn't, well, they were oftentimes changing leaders. There'd be coups rise up. Now again, in our country, we've never had a coup. We've never had a dictatorship rise up and take over. Uh, no. I might step out of the classroom and find it's all changed since I've been in here. But, uh, at the moment, we've never had a coup, never had a dictatorship. Again, we don't depend on the ability of a ruler. We respect or hopefully we respect our leaders because of the position they hold, whether we like them or not. And a lot of the time, we don't like the persons who are in power, but still, we follow them. Um, Oh yes, about the religion, something very important. Back in February, there was a debate between a creationist and 
an evolution scientist. The debate was not over the issue of evolution. They had agreed not to touch that subject. For one thing, evolution cannot be debated. I don't know if I mentioned that in this class, but it's simply an article of faith. You either accept it or you don't, but it's, there's no science to that. But they, they agreed about it. They won't debate it, but they debated over the age of the Earth. Ken Ham and Bill Nye, some of you might remember the debates. In the ancient world, there was never any conflict between religion and science. Religion, science were one and the same. They knew no difference. Now, you might have a hard time believing this. Recently, as in the early 1700s, Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientists of all time, did not know the difference between magic and science. I mean, you could show him a device like this one, and he'd think this is a magical device. I mean, you know, hey, it's magic. You can use it to see pictures. You can see the person you're talking to. You can talk. Or, hey, that's a myst. We come up with a lot of mystical devices. The lights and light in this room to him. But he didn't know the difference between magic and science. They did not know the difference between science and theology. Theology was science. Science was theology. No debate. No argument. Um, in fact, I will say this. It seems like the only religion that conflicts with science is Christianity. Um, and in no way am I being anti-Christian to say that. If anything, I'm being anti-science. And I do believe in science, I mean strongly, but there are areas where they are. Oh, I'll tell you, this might be, there's a lot of scientific knowledge that has changed a lot since I was a kid. I mean, we once believed that Mercury kept the same face of the sun. Today, we don't. And in the realm of science, a lot of scientists, back in 1950, about the year after I was born, scientists were on the verge of explaining everything. Today, a lot of science are admitting there's a lot of stuff out there that we're not going to explain. Um, folks, some of the stuff I've been reading from Stevens from Scientific Journals, I mean, I just found that on a quantum level, that quanta behaves one way when it thinks you're not observing it and behaves a different way when you're observing it. Do any of you have any idea what I'm talking about? Maybe you don't. When you shine a beam of light this way and then turn that light red, the beam you shine this way is going to turn red also. Yes, have you ever familiar with that experiment with Yes, the theory that you're the outcome of an experiment will change by who's watching it. By who's watching it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, that is contrary to human logic, contrary to Newtonian and Einsteinian physics. Okay, the outcome of the experiment depends on who's watching it. Well, excellent. Um, again, how much do we know about subatomic particles? It can be summed up in one word, folks. And who knows what that word I'm thinking? How much do we know? Nothing. Nothing. How much do we know about the universe beyond our solar system? It can be summed up in one word. When we die, Newton's laws of gravity that seem to work so well inside our own solar system don't work outside our solar system unless that 95% of you is made up of something called dark matter. Any of you heard of dark matter? Supposedly, that's what the universe consists of, 95, but probably we've never found dark matter. What can make the distant galaxies move away from us at speeds of 25,000 miles, not an hour, but a second? We don't know the answer. All right, anyway, science, great and wonderful, but has its limitations. Anyway, they, but they had no conflict between theology and science. All right. Um, Oh yes, I mentioned, I think, well, I'll mention again. All ancient peoples had a flood story. They had a zodiac that consists of 12 symbols. They all had dragon stories. They all had a seven day week with the seventh day being a blessed day or a special day. Um, how come they all had these same stories? So well, these stories were in existence before mankind separated its back. I mean, that's one logical explanation. Now, did I talk much about dragons in this class? Okay, you know what I think about dragons? 
They were the dinosaurs. Um, and they did not die out 65 million years ago. Anyway, one thing, now again I keep emphasizing, ancient man had a different mindset than we do. A different mindset in politics and theology and science and his outlook. Um, Oh yes, something else. They didn't have a constitution. They generally did not have a democracy either. We don't find democracies till we come to the Greeks. And I mentioned, I mean, I'll tell you something. At the last class I taught back in the spring before summer break, I said before the final exam, I want to say something I've never said to a class before. I'll say to this one. I have all but lost faith in democracy. Democracy will not work when the enemy is just over the hill. I mean, if, suppose you lived in the ancient world. You lived in the ancient world. You lived in a city-state, and of course in the center of your city or in a property would be a temple, and the temple was where you'd worship your gods, so there'd be a temple, there'd be a palace where your king lived, and just over the horizon would be your enemy, and over this horizon would be a different enemy. And you could not when the enemy started to invade, have people debating, you know, well, would we be better off under them than we are under our present king? During the Civil War, both North and South suspended their democracies. Abe Lincoln ruled like a king. So did Jefferson Davis. Both sides suspended democracy. John Paul Jones said, regardless of the principles for which we are fighting, we can have none of those principles here on board my ship. On board my ship, I'm boss. What I say goes free on your opinion. If you're a contrarian mind. Yes? Um, in that movie, uh, Lincoln, that yes. just came out a while ago. Yeah, I saw it. It kind of shows that, like, Abraham Lincoln doing that, just ordering. Kind of... He ruled like a dictator. Yeah. He took, and well, and not only Lincoln, but later on, Woodrow Wilson suspended free speech. This, and he, he jailed dissenters, and one of the more famous dissenters in jail was Eugene Debs. Again, you can look it up. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt suspended free speech and controlled the press. But during the Vietnam War, we allowed student dissenters to protest, and folk, I got something to remind you of, we lost. The Vietnamese went through a period of discouragement. They said, how can we defeat the United States? They weren't getting any help from Russia. They were not getting any significant help from, this, from China. And they said, how can we take on and work the United States? Then they noticed our young people, people my age, protesting on college campuses. So they said to one another, hey, if we could just hold out long enough, their youth will compel them to quit fighting us. And they won. Now, as the world seems to get smaller, something about our political correctness is going to have to get. All right. Um, now, I will probably leave this class and start thinking more about what could I have said, what more did I say. But anyway, chapter one of the test that you take, I want to say this. According to my watch, we have about five minutes left. So don't. Anyway, according to my, I mean, chapter one, half your question from chapter one. If you've noticed, I've spent three periods on chapter one. I'll spend one period on chapter two and one on chapter three. Half of your test or more will be on chapter one. Uh, so you might spend some time studying that. The stuff that I have put on the board here. Now, don't go out of here thinking I promise it's because something's going to be on a test. Even if I were to tell you this is going to be on a test, I don't know if it's going to be on your test because I'm giving you a different set of questions to get to the class. So what I ask you might be not I mean, I could say, well, this will be on the test, what I have on the board. You might get the question, you might not. So, but anyway. All right, um, again, because I don't want to give you the same questions I'm giving them, or vice versa. Um, all right, um, now, next time, and then we'll close in about a minute, I want to say this about India right from the start. 
you think that some of the stuff I've been talking about is queer. The people of India have an ancient set of writings called the Vedas. The Vedas, again, describe spacecraft, winged horses, ruling, visiting other planets, submarines that could come out of the water and fly, aircraft, missiles, and stuff that seemed like nuclear bombs. Well, now I had a student in another class ask a question. Well, what if somebody would say that our Superman stories are real? That's what we read in the Superman book. Well, supposing we were to find the city of Metropolis somewhere. I mean, those of you who read the Superman book, right? like, that would make Superman look real. In the case of the Vedas, they talk about a nuclear war, and the city of Mohenjo-Daro looks like it was destroyed by a nuclear holocaust. Again, that's hard. That's not just written records. That's not just fans. That looks like hard evidence. And uh, as one of you mentioned, the, uh, there are places that have glass on a desert. Only a nuclear explosion could create that. As far as volcanoes would do it, nothing really burns in a desert, no, no wood. So uh, what could create a desert that is covered by glass? Um, some kind of fire holocaust. All right.